it is significant. Implications for infrastructure of electromobility and the implications of infrastructure for infrastructure. Generally, you'd think, oh, well, just recharge points, right? Um, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> and Charlie's going to explain to you why it's not just about that uh, and the opportunities that are there now with smart systems and how they integrate into the grid and how um, electric vehicles um, are not just dragging out from the grid but actually can help support the grid. Um, and that whole process is now emerging quite quickly so getting the engineering, getting the bureaucracy, the regulatory environments, all of that are emerging quite quickly. So Charlie's at the forefront of that. Charlie is an engineer who has worked with me for about 10 years um, uh, as has Cheryl and we uh, have uh, two research groups in the SBE that uh, that um, Keith Hampson runs. Keith uh, is the president of CIB, and that process um, has been a national one. So we have universities across Australia that are linked together with industry partners, um, which are both government and and businesses. And so we do projects that are very much related to their agendas and they last 18 months and they start again on another part of that. But Charlie's been going on this electric vehicles and the smart city stuff that fits them into systems for a while. So I'm going to hand over to him. And after that, at three o'clock, our group, which is one, two, three, four, five, six of us, so we're the majority anyway, are going to be here at 3 till, isn't it? No, 3.30, of course, yes. No, is that right? Yeah, 3.30, it's just set five on the board there. Okay, 3.30, you're right. Trackless trams and transit activated corridors is our session afterwards. But that's really about how electric vehicles can also be transit and, and micro mobility and how they fit together in the city. So I will hand over to Charlie and he will take us through what he's doing and um, we can all yeah, jump in. If anyone wants to ask a question, please do, because we'll just give you the microphone and what was your name? Your name is Michelle, right? So just Michelle. scream out for Michelle, look for the green hat and we're away. Fantastic. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. And thanks, Michelle, for the support. Really appreciate it. Um, as Peter said, I would love to be there with you. Um, uh, but I'm here looking after my mum. She had a knee reconstruction, uh, which is a replacement, which is actually pretty amazing sort of thing you can do these days. Um, so so that, that that's cool. So thanks, thanks Peter, for stepping in and, and helping to facilitate this process. Um, so this session is part of the task group 91. So we're a task group that's focused around sort of infrastructure implications uh, in sustainable development. And at the last meeting when we got together, we sort of started to look out at what would be some of the big implications and we looked at around electromobility. Um, as Peter said, at that time, electromobility was really just talk of where public charging needs to go. And I think it's accelerated and developed uh, much faster than, than the activity in the space. Um, to, to a much more integrated and challenging um, space where electromobility is bringing, really bringing the interests of the transport sector and the energy sector together in a way that has never happened before. Um, I teach uh, in the energy space and also some of the transport space and I tell my students that really the last five or six years has been a re has really both transport and energy have had a, had a, a reinvention um, and they're actually getting 
getting quite interesting. I remember when I did my undergraduate civil degree, the transport course was probably the most boring one that we did, and we learned about how to design roundabouts. Um, but now I think transport is actually pretty damn cool because it's becoming integrated. And now that the overlay with the energy sector, I think it's actually the place where where, the, where some of the best and most interesting innovation in the entire sustainability space is happening. Um, and and there's a lot there's a lot to work out there, not just not just um, which I'm sure Krishna will, will be able to expand on, but not just bringing people together from different sectors that have very different ways of operating, but also figuring out who's responsible for what, who can do what, who should be making what decision, how to manage different things, how to protect people and protect consumers and protect companies. All of these questions are back up for grabs. So we're we're seeing a, you know, a, I don't like to use the word disruptive. I, I, I personally don't think technology is disruptive. I think the way we respond to new technology can either be positive or disruptive. I mean, in the European Union, they respond not every time, but a lot of the times they respond to new technologies by phasing it in over you know, eight to 12 years. Whereas in Australia, we tend to have a knee jerk reaction and we do it when we have to. And of course, that's going to be disruptive, right? But the technology itself is just technology. How we use it decides whether we have a disruption or whether we have an opportunity. Um, and I, I don't think the transport sector and the energy sector has seen a level of opportunity really in the in the living history of of the senior people that are working in either of those two spaces. Um, this this shift across from um, car dependent fossil fuel driven um, freeway based approach to transport, which we've had since there's been cars. And then at the same time, the shift away from centralized coal, heavily coal production energy to little generators all over cities that are plugging into the grid and electrons are coming in and coming out in places where they weren't designed to come in and come out. Those two things on their own have caused massive, a need for massive changes and rethinking the way those systems are designed and delivered. But then to complement that, to make it a real super storm of opportunity, um, those two sectors have now come together in that the vehicles shifting away from a from a polluting energy source have shifted to electricity, and they're then putting they're adding additional um, distributed loads and demands and generation opportunities into the grid. And how to manage all of that right now is all coming together. So we we have the pleasure of working with the Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre, and it prides itself on being industry driven about as you know as about as about as much about as far industry driven as you can be for a research based group. I mean, obviously, we want to create things that we can publish that can help help in, you know, inform other you know, PhD students and other researchers. Like we 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 really want to make sure that what we learn gets out there to the world, but at the same time. Every week we have to we're talking to our partners. Every every couple of weeks we're having a meeting with our partners. So it has to be very relevant to what the partners are going through, um, which for me is is kind of what makes it worth worth doing. Then we're also partnering with the CRC, so Australian an Australian based research collaborative around renewable energy and in the network space. And we'll be bringing this SBE work and the CRC work together in future to do projects together. Um, and it really starting to think about how electromobility affects infrastructure. There's lots of opportunity. There's lots of challenges. There's, there's just, I think it's going to call for every tool we've got in our toolkit, plus a bunch of them that we haven't developed yet, in order to properly navigate this stuff. And it's not just is the technology right. It's not is the business case right. It's not you know all. It's not just one thing. And the real complicating factor here is it's. The, the, the sort of landscape conditions, if you're talking about Geos's approach, the landscape conditions in both of these sectors has substantially shifted. It's not a matter of just a niche technology finding its way into the existing landscape. The actual landscape itself is substantially shifting in both the energy and the transport sector. And then the overlap between them provides an, an, an additional level, level of complexity. So we're at a point where if you want to get a new energy project, that's in this new space, the distributed transport connected integrated space. As Marie you know, and her team and, and all of you guys in the room have been banging your head against the wall for quite a few years trying to show the economics of this, there isn't a spreadsheet that's going to give you down to two decimal places exactly how much money an investor is going to make if they get involved in this project because it hasn't been done. 
Now, that can be an, that's not an excuse not to do anything, but we have to use different mechanisms. We can't just say we have to wait until someone else proves it and then maybe we'll do it. We have to somehow just get moving, you know, so using vehicles like the SBE to trans to, to bring the latest understanding about things into the minds of decision makers is really powerful. And then also working with the CRC because we can do demonstration projects. We can get permission to do projects where we don't have the spreadsheet all filled out to the nth degree. We've got a pretty good idea of the main, you know, profit outcomes. Like we're selling electricity, and you know, we're selling storage. There's, there's the, the, like the core of it's there, but it's not fleshed out to the detail that that um, you know Del Deloitte's or one of the big investors is going to want to put money into yet, right? So we're in that space, which I think is is a really interesting space to be in. I think a lot of you work in that space. Um, so what I'd love to do today as part of this module is I'll just quickly show you what we've done with the SBE. Um, the reports are all available. You've got them there. I don't, I'm not going to I'm not going to sort of um, speak at you because you, you know, you've got a lot of space and we don't have a huge amount of time. And then what I'd love to do is to bring into this conversation some specific questions that are being asked. We work with a number of industry partners like, like quite a few industry partners um, and this and and I want to ask a question that's related to um, integrating electromobility with infrastructure and just to get your thoughts on it I'd love to hear your thoughts on it we're about to go into a phase of designing a demonstration project you know we're reading all the papers we're talking to people who are doing similar programs we're doing all the right things but we'd also love to hear from from anyone else's view and, and take advantage of this opportunity so if anyone does anyone have any comments or thoughts or questions or concerns before we keep going? What do you think about that, James? Does that sound all right? Sounds we've good. Got the, thumb, we've got the thumbs up. I'm good. What about you, Cheryl? Are we, are we all right? I just fixed it, Charlie, so we can see you now. It's good. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. All righty. All right, we'll get going. Okay, so with the SBE, we did a series of reports for the Western Australian government about 12 or just a bit longer now just over 12 months ago where the question obviously was being raised how do we how do we plan for this ev invasion you know in our system how do we manage that and what they asked us to do is what are the main factors what, what what they wanted us to do was to say this is the curve of adoption of evs so that you can then plan for it and what we learned pretty quickly was there is no curve um, we looked at three major studies that were trying to produce a curve and all three curves were different so not a, not, a, not a great starting point. But what we did say was, look, let's look at what's affecting the up uptake. And we figured there's five key things that are affecting the uptake. Let's just expand this. The five, th five key things was this, this not understanding the purchase price versus running price. You know, Cheryl and I have been talking about this for 20 years in efficiency and Amy Lovins, this whole idea that if you buy something that's cheaper to run, even though you pay more upfront, you save money over the long term. But trying to convince consumers of that because there's a lack of trust in a in a you know in a, in the in the economy or in the in the capitalist system, there's not a lot of trust that your thing is actually going to last these days like they used to be. Things used to last a long time, you know. Um, that that can be a pretty hard sell. The second one was sort of range anxiety, and when we looked into it, even up to about 2018, maybe into the early parts of 2019, the average range of an EV was about 100 kilometres on a charge. And that kind of means that if you're doing about 30 to 40 kilometers a day with your average commute and shopping and dropping the kids off and stuff, and you forget to charge, say, one night and maybe two nights, you could get stuck, right? So that, that's kind of a bit of a legitimate concern, right, with that technology option. But by the time we got into 2021, the average range was just over 460 kilometers on one charge. So, I mean, you would have to forget to plug your car in at night six nights in a row before you got into any trouble. Okay, so that's that's that element of it. But then the, then there's the sort of the argument that maybe 20, 25% of people can't plug it in at home. They live in a multi-story building. They don't have a car park. They've got on-street parking, something like that. My sense is that because electricity travels through cables, we can get cables to cars anywhere. So I'm not sure how legitimate that argument is. But there is an argument to say that some people won't be able to plug in. Fair enough. And I think the main concern there is that if you're uh, if you're in a low income home and you can't plug in at home, then having an EV is very difficult for you because I don't know those of you that have got EVs. I've got a hybrid. If you now go you know to the mall or to the market and plug in your car, you're paying top dollar to charge your car. You're paying two to three times what you would pay if you plugged it in at your home overnight. 
So we've got a pay, pace where so low income families are forced to pay top dollar if they want to take on this new technology. So that's that's something that's really legitimate. But the increase in range to over 400, I think pretty much blows out 90 percent, 95 percent of people's concerns. I mean, we all love to have that Australian dream that we're going to jump in our car and drive for 2000 kilometers and put out a swag and catch a barramundi. But I have never done that. And I don't I mean, I know a couple of people who, who do it, but you know, it's a very small percentage. And Lexus have said, look, if you buy our EV and you want to do that weekend, we will you bring your EV to us. We'll lend you a fossil fuel car and you can do your weekend and then you bring it back and we'll give you back your EV. All right, let's just take that off the table. So those that the, the range thing, what we've pretty much found is the range thing is, is non is a non starter. Now, if you're looking, this is for commercial vehicles, maybe for fleets, if you're doing a lot of travel in the day and you're really, you know, you're doing five or 600 kilometers worth of travel in one day, you may have to factor in a sort of fast charging, but that's unlikely as well. But then we move into transport of heavy, heavier things like um, trucks. So Peter, you know, Peter and I have a lot of conversations around the option for trucks. It seems to us, you know, it's early stage, but it seems like the electric truck is going to win over the combustion fuel or the fuel cell truck. So hydrogen or natural gas or or fossil fuels. It's looking very likely that even for large heavy vehicles, electric will be the way. And of course, they will need to charge at certain places. Now, whether that's in a service station or a, or a charging depot, I and mean, it makes sense where you stop and you, know, you charge up and you have a feed, um, that sort of thing. So that can be incorporated into it. So I think once once upon a time, range anxiety was a big factor for everyone. I think now it's a big factor for a very small amount of people, and it's not really slowing down the uptake. Um, the next one was sort of hand in hand in hat with that was the charging rate. There was a lot of talk about you know charging rate. Um, the charging rate for me is irrelevant because I plug it in at night and I'm on an off peak tariff. So I'm in South Australia. I'm in a, I'm on a I'm on a solar soaker tariff, and from like 11 o'clock at night till four or five o'clock in the morning. That is plenty of time for my car to fully charge. So I I don't want a fast charger. I don't I don't want to put too much stress on my battery. I'm happy for it to take four or five hours. But if I'm a delivery driver or something and I'm doing three or four hundred kilometers and I'm and I want to fill up, then perhaps I go back to my base and I want to do half an hour worth of charging. So so really both of this range anxiety and charging rate initially started as big barriers for everyone. And I think they've now come down to barriers for very specific smaller parts of the of the sector. So they're not really affecting uptake either. Um, the capacity based factors were really just the charging infrastructure. Lots to talk about whether there's enough charging infrastructure. Obviously, we you know we've covered that in the range and the charge rate. And the main one sort of unanswered one was this grid capacity. So what happens when you've got, um, I don't know, a million EVs in Australia? that are plugging in to the electricity grid at various locations. There may be some pattern. We might get some AI pattern that can help us to understand it. But really, you know, we can we can plug it in at home, we can plug it in at work, we can we want to we want to. Now the, the problem is that the best thing for the electricity grid is for the storage to be available when the energy is generated, right? So that's the solar during the day. So ideally for electricity grid you'd have all of these mobile batteries plugged in somewhere in the grid that doesn't overload that part of the grid and and soaks up the additional energy during the day, right? But that's not necessarily what the users are going to want to do. So I want to plug it in at night and I want to use it during the day. I don't want to plug, have to drive somewhere and plug it in. Now, maybe if it drives itself one day, you know, it can drop, drop my kids off to school and then go and park somewhere strategic to the grid and plug itself in. You know, maybe that's 15, 20 years away. But for right now, there's a there's a really big question as to how do EVs interact with the grid? What's the most effective way? If we leave it as ad hoc, because we because up until this point, much like the solar energy and much like H like HVAC and air conditioners before that, it's been left up to consumer buying preferences rather than an actual strategic approach by our by our by our politicians. So we had the first range with the HVAC. We had this, not many people had sort of HVAC, they had different at different situations and then um, very cheap HVAC units became came onto the market from Asia and suddenly the uptake in, in HVAC in Australia overnight just absolutely ballooned and their their two kilowatt systems four kilowatt systems six kilowatt systems just going in everywhere and it was it was not prepared for so the system had to we've, we've been in, we've been talking with the guys that are that were that went through this whole process and they shared the whole journey i won't go into that in detail because we're running out of time but 
basically what happened is they, they were forced to upgrade the poles and wires. And they did that by putting a bit of extra capacity just, just to handle some future growth. And they thought they had that problem solved. But then the solar panels came online and the, and the approach was, look, solar's not going to take off. It's only for rich people and hippies. Um, they got that completely wrong as well. Solar's taken off. And it didn't feel like there was much of a problem because it was just taking up that bit of excess, that excess that was put there in the aftermath of the HVAC kind of masked the early stages of the impact of having solar panels and batteries starting to be plugged into the system. But now that that extra capacity is kind of running out and we're in a we're in a we're in a bit of trouble. Um, so eyes are now turned to how do they fit in? What do they do? So in this in this project, we also looked at the revenue implications for government. So we looked at what are some of the things here we go, you know, things like um, um, economic benefits, standards, job creation, um, you know, grid service for from EVs, having buses and trains when they're not being used, plugged in as storage. Um, the Shenzhen bus company found that when they electrified their 7,000 buses in Shenzhen, they actually made more money than from ticketing from allowing garbage trucks and light commercial vehicles to charge in their bus charging depots, which were distributed around the city. So without even knowing it, they created a whole different business stream that ended up being much more profitable. So this, this the the public transport authorities are thinking, how do we how do we harness the fact that a whole bunch of cars come and park at our nodes? So we've got if the cars come and plug in, maybe they get a little discount on their ticket or something. I don't know. Um, there's maybe there's solar panels where they park under the solar panels and they just soak it straight up. All of these sort of combinations mean that the business model or the revenue models for agencies uh, are changing. And you, the, the agencies that get onto it early are the ones that are going to harness it, and the ones that don't obviously aren't going to. So we did a bit of a summary on that. We had a look a bit of look on green bonds. Um, one of the things that really kind of freaked people out in Queensland and Western Australia was when a European bank had a look at the average greenhouse gas emissions per capita for each of the each of its um, each of its in, its investments that it had bonds and in investments and any of them that were the the emissions per capita was higher than the national average, they dumped their bonds and they did that in Western Australia and Queensland. Um, and that's significant amounts of money based on a pretty blunt instrument that, you know, people like Jan and Peter have been talking about for a long time to deaf ears actually happened. And they're like, whoa, oh, my God, what's going on? How can we, you know, how can we do that? Which is good, right? It's a driver for change, but it shouldn't it shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, and then the last section really just looking around what's the role of transport agencies. And what we kind of came to was you're not going to be able to predict what's happening. It's going to, there's a lot of uncertainty in this market. So you can only really, as a government, you can choose one of three approaches. You can take a passive approach um, where you don't really do much and you wait for the impacts. You can take a preemptive approach where you don't really do much and you might prepare a little bit for the benefits that are coming, or you can take a proactive approach and say, right, we are going to prepare the way. We're going to provide the subsidies that are needed. We're going to phase them out. The one, the one thing that we found actually that had the most impact on uptake of EVs in Australia, which I was very surprised by and initially was very pessimistic about, like I, I didn't believe it until I saw the figures and talked to the government agencies and the, and the groups involved, was literally just the signal that our federal government sends the world around how likely it is that you're going to sell your EV in our country. So if you're producing EVs that you know are going to sell before they even hit the showroom floor, you do not sell them to Australia. You send them to South Korea, you send them to Europe, you send them to America, because they're not even going to make it to the showroom floor. They're going to be bought before they even get off the boat. But if you look in Australia and you look at this ridiculousness that our politicians do, bringing coal, lumps of coal into 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 chambers and, you know, all of this just rubbish that goes on, you're going to take one look at that. And Volkswagen released some remarks saying they took one look at all that stuff and said Australia is just not ready for a market. We're not even going to bother investing the time to set up the distribution channels for our very affordable high range EVs in Australia because it's going to be banging our head against the wall of dickhead politicians that are just blocking the way. So they, they don't care. They don't lose a cent. They sell their cars elsewhere. All right. So the number one take home I got from here, uh, and I guess this is going back to what Cheryl was saying before the session started, this sort of this this grassroots, this continued effort to change the politics of this situation so that the, that the right sort of messages start coming out and we start getting the sort of vehicles and technology that we deserve in this country.
All right, so we're getting there. I'm, I'm using all the time. But I just want to, I'm going to pose the question now if my tech works. Come on, baby. There it is. All right, so this brings us to the um, the CRC, the race CRC. We're working, I'll just do a short version. We're working with a whole bunch of partners. Uh, we we're lucky, like I said, to have Volkswagen, some battery companies, um, power companies, retailers, generators, um, government agencies. That's the power of a CRC. I mean, they are, of course, large academic, slow moving, bureaucratic, often frustrating entities, but they also put these people in the room. So if you do get into a project and, a, and a, on a project team that is quite proactive and industry savvy, I, th I think I'm, it hasn't been proven yet, but Peter and I are pretty sure we can actually do something meaningful within this structure, um, which is pretty cool. So we've got researchers from all over the place in you know, RMIT, UTS, Curtin, Monash, Griffith all involved. Um, on, on a multi-stage project, but this is the interesting part. So we did a full ex we did a full assessment of all the other pilots and and programs that are happening in managed charging and vehicle to grid and all this all this stuff. And then we did a summary of that. We worked with our partners to to identify which ones they were most interested in, and we've come up with these four topics. So first one's reasonably predictable. What are the numbers? And that's going to be difficult to put them together. We'll have to piece them together from different projects, right? Second big one was what about standardization? Are we going to have unique standards in Australia that are going to really slow things down? Or are we going to appropriately adopt international standards that are going to enable us to move quicker? Um, I mean, I know the trackless tram guys are facing that with just things like the width of vehicle being a thing that is actually a blockage, which really shouldn't be, right? Um, and then the, the number three is one I'd love to, to pose to the room to have some comments and thoughts. Um, the real question is, it's the energy utilities are really interested in using EVs as storage in the grid. But what happens when neighborhood scale, community scale, what happens when bigger non-mobile batteries start to come online? Is it going to be the same thing that happened with solar panels where early adopters of solar panels were paid great big feed-in tariffs, but then when they underestimate, substantially underestimated the demand for it, then they say, well, hang on, well, we can't pay you anymore. It's actually messing up our old system. We're going to charge you. So completely flip the economics. So is that the same thing that's going to happen with EVs? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we want we want, we want, want bi-directional charging. We want to manage your EV. And you you set up a system that, that that is good for you over 12 or 15 years. But then five years into the track, the energy utility says, oh, actually, we've got enough grid scale storage. Um, we, we're, we're not paying you anymore for your storage. But you've just bought this bi-directional charger. You've put in this extra technology. You know you've agreed to this managed charging regime. But is it going to? Are you going to get? Are you going to get? Is it going to backfire? So Peter, I'm just wondering if there's anyone in the room that may have some thoughts. Maybe you could kick it off. Or all right. I'm sure we could kick it along, Charlie. If you're needing cool. a bit of a break. Um, so the question, will bi-directional charging be profitable over the longer term with increasing grid community scale storage and behind the meter batteries? Not only be profitable, be highly profitable in my view. It will be a game changer, particularly if we can do community scale storage so that it's shared by everyone. And that's increasing. I heard them the minister talked this morning about community batteries going in. Okay. What do you I wonder how many. I wonder how many that there are, because we've got certainly uh, quite a lot now in Perth because we're being pushed into it. Uh, mm. Getting so much solar, you can't. have got no choice other than to put community batteries in to try and manage the grid. But nobody is talking about electric vehicles as part of that solution. Right. Because they don't quite know how to do it. Yeah. That's a big issue for us in Perth, where some days 80 to 90 percent of the grid is powered by rooftop solar. Jesus. It's um and it's growing at one megawatt a day. <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely going to have a lot of solar, but we need the batteries and that whole story about how we get that, that storage in there and how the electric vehicles fit. If you've got a solution to that, or another question. Much in need. 
Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a solution. <laughs> well, I have, I have a solution, but I don't think you'll like it. Um, <laughs> look, look, I think, um, you know, we, we are seeing, as Peter's pointed out, particularly in Western Australia, um, being a, almost a canary in the coal mine or um, postcard from the future for networks with high penetration of distributed resources. Um, you know, what we are seeing is a lot of assets going in behind the meter, um, yeah. but we're not seeing a lot of the utility organisations coordinating and leveraging those assets. Yeah. So, you know, uh, following energy transition theory, energy systems evolve to pursue, you know, greater efficiencies and lower costs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what we're, the trends we're actually seeing in the network over in Western Australia is the utility themselves investing in their own technologies and not utilising um, the um, systems behind the meter or the customer sided systems. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to battery storage, um, you know, whilst we are seeing similar uptake for battery systems um, as we have with uh, solar, um, uh, last few years, uh, the trend has diverged, but um, pricing may get back on track and that will continue. Um, we're also seeing the utility themselves double down and putting in their own um, community. Uh, so the community batteries Peter's talking about, by and large owned by the utility. Um, we're seeing uh, a gas turbine, um, uh, one of our larger generators potentially replaced by a giant battery. Um, and what this suggests is um, a storage trend that we've seen in the evolution of the internet. So um, when the internet uh, first began, it had zero storage, um, very little storage. A lot of the communication was real time. Um, we then saw um, individual computers come online when people had their own storage. You know, we'd store things on our own computers, we'd have our own hard drives. But we've started to see the evolution of cloud storage, you know, so lots of hosting and storage services um, provided by large enterprise solutions like Dropbox, um, you know, similar, akin to energy storage, yeah. I mean, memory storage is energy storage. You're just yeah. storing ones and zeros in forms of bitmaps. Um, but 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 what we'll see is, I I think a, more of a consolidation on the utility side. So yeah. um, networks pushing to own storage as assets, and energy retailers owning storage as the new models going forward. Um, not efficiently using, utilizing resources like EVs or um, home batteries. But we'll see. Hope I'm wrong. That was brilliant, James. He's just finished his PhD on that. So that was very <laughs> succinct. That was, thank be... you for sharing that. Now, Charlie, um, can you tell us about Starling? Because that's another model. Starling's a member of the CRC race, and it's a cooperative approach to solar batteries. Mm. And I don't know if electric vehicles fit in there yet. Yeah, but... I, think, I think Mike's kind of the expert on that. Is Dean there? Dean's there. Do you, do you want to tell us about Sterling? Okay. Well, I haven't been involved with Starling, so I can't help you there. Okay. Well, Starling is a West Australian company who We're looking faced, to... faced this idea that everybody was getting solar on their roof but didn't know quite how to manage how it all fitted in with the grid. So um, they proposed a model where if you wanted solar, mm -hmm. they would give you the solar and a battery and manage that for you for mm. a price. So you get a monthly fee and they look after your power for you and um, the battery and the yeah, solar. Nice. That part, sounds like, sounds part like PG&E whole... in California in the 90s, Peter. It's a bit hippie, isn't it? But um, it's, uh, it's working. They've got several thousand members now. So these co-ops, are they're not geographically linked but they are linked through the grid and through your mobile phone. That's how you can find out what's happening there and 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 your solar on the roof and your battery are part of that cooperative. Yeah. Not a bad idea, is it? But well, let's see. That how how far can we go with that? I don't know. Here's a question. Ah, question on here. Brian uh, asks. Uh, okay, Grain is asking: um, Is it feasible to use our uh, our car battery to po to power our home, independent of the power companies? That's a really good question, Grain. That's what I was thinking when James was was talking. If if the utilities are going to kind of dismiss that as a resource, and understandably, because there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of factors that make that a really complicated option. 
not to mention just just the cyber security of all these devices to the grid but surely we can use we can absorb some solar in our cars somehow and cut down our you know, peak load shave or peak, peak cut our peak at home by plugging it in that makes it worthwhile to uh, uh, cost makes it a, you know, makes makes the dollars add up but also there's some argument we were that so the number four there will will allow managed charging degrade my battery there's a bit of a school of thought that if the battery in your vehicle is allowed to properly cycle from its lower to its upper levels rather than go partially down and then back up and then partially if it's allowed to go all the way down and all the way up it'll its performance improves or it, it's better over time so maybe the house itself can actually be a load for your car to make sure that it discharges down before it goes back up again something like that there's there's something happening in that space but I, I, yeah I, I wonder if it's really if, if if it always stays behind the meter and it just becomes third party software that you install just like anything else and then and the utilities really don't get involved in it all they see is a is a is a slightly different demand profile for that meter james is that what you're seeing do you want to add anything to that? Maybe Dean as well. I know he's got a lot to say about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, um, uh, yeah, my, I, whilst I talked about um, uh, the uh, participation of DER across a network, um, you know, the, the the focus is and the opportunity is to really pry open the customer sided um, side of the meter. So, um, you know, once again, using Western Australia as a case study, um, you know, what we have seen with rooftop solar is uh, in aggregate, um, the nameplate capacity of all those rooftop solar systems have become the largest generator by nameplate capacity on the network, on the Swiss. Um, they are larger in capacity than all the gas turbines added up together. Um, and yeah, absolutely. So the next step, um, you know, for the prosumer um, with the customer sited asset is to get greater utilization um, from that solar panel. And yeah, that could certainly be in the form of a a car that doubles as a home battery. Um, it could uh, more simply be um, just electrification. So um, mm. converting your heating and cooling um, systems and, and cooking systems to one premise upon electrification, uh, yeah. in addition to you know, energy efficiency and insulation type um, uh, investments you can make behind the meter. But yeah, absolutely. That That's certainly what we're seeing in reality. Um, this, uh, what, what I call the prosumer led network effects of distributed energy resources. Um, and that being, yeah, largely consolidating behind the meter. Brilliant. Dean? Yeah, so so just addressing, can you run your house um, independent of the grid? So, you know, the, the bi-directional charges are currently quite expensive, and the only serious trial I'm aware of is Nissan, uh, with I think 150 vehicles in the UK uh, on that, but, but then the utility is kind of in the mix. Uh, whereas if you buy a Ford F-150 or a Nissan Leaf, uh, or the Kia EV6 or the Ionic 5, whatever it is, um, they, they actually will run appliances out of standard power outlet. And mm. I think they, li they limit it to between two and a half and five kilowatts. Um, uh, there's only so much you can do out of a standard power outlet. Um, mm. But there is no reason that couldn't get bigger. And at the moment, we don't sort of have a, a thing that plugs plugs into the house to run the house, right? It's, it's like... Yeah, the F one fifty has got a, like a the big one's got I think about a hundred and forty kilowatt battery. Yeah, or something. I reckon you could run. Four you could, you could even run. You could even run a WA house for a week on that. Um, <laughs> so, so, so the capacity's there, and at least three or three or four uh, manufacturers are, are anticipating that. And at the moment, they've just done the simple thing, so you can just plug in your power board and run your stuff. Um, but at the moment, there's no, there's no, there's no plug behind the meter that runs the house. Um, but the, the inverter would do that, and maybe the inverters need to evolve to do that. Um, one other little thing, in Japan, you know, they, they do have a lot of disasters, and they actually employ fleets of Nissan Leafs as emergency power stations. <laughs> so, so actually, yeah, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, bottles. yeah, so I think that's why Nissan is involved in these uh, vehicle-to-grid trials. They're, they're, they're sort of out there on the cutting edge. Yeah, just completing that, in We've got Toyota people on the IPCC transport mm. committee that I've been managing for the last three years. And that they told us why Toyota and Nissan and so on went into hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, mm -hmm. it's largely failed, was because they thought they would last longer as power sources after a tsunami. So right. you take 
your truck or your bus or your mm. vehicle fleet with hydrogen fuel cell, drive them into the area and you've got a power source. Wow. They, they bet that hydrogen fuel cells would work better. But it hasn't worked. They're always still three to four times as expensive and you can't get the hydrogen there. That's the problem. Yeah. It just doesn't store easily or just be distributed. So they've lost that race and they're now catching up and coming back into electric vehicles. So Nissan Leafs and so on. Toyota That's still right. haven't really properly recovered from that. Um, but it it is a big story. Now, can I just follow through the idea of being able to power your own house with your solar battery and electric vehicle and be independent really appealed to the American Western spirit of being able to create your own future out there and not have anything and none of these nasty people you don't like around you and you got your guns to protect you. So, but it doesn't appeal to me. I think it would destroy cities if we did this. It's not part of what is common good outcomes. It's not part of, I think, uh, the the future. For, that, that will be much more city oriented because cities are where life is created for so many things. Mm. And still, your mum has got her knee operation in Adelaide. She wouldn't have got it out in the bush living in her own little house on the by herself. Um, so this is um, important, I think, and I know you're from City of Melbourne, architecture. You're an architect, and so you, you're part of this story of how you can make cities work as well. And that's really what we're talking about in the 330 session. Mm -hmm. And it's important to see that electric ve vehicles of all kinds will be part of this future but they are also electric public transport, electric micro mobility and electric vehicles, uh, cars, and they need to be fitted together to make the cities work better, and they can. But you will still need the grid to enable mm. proper sharing and proper services to be distributed equally. Um, it's a, the grid is a great leveller it enables rich mm. and poor to live together. Um, and the problem of scattering is that the wealthy will be able to do it, the poor will just live off the crumbs. They won't have all that tech, but they'll still be trying to live with the dregs of the fossil fuel age. Um, that's not acceptable. Well, the we other thing that will happen is as fewer and fewer people are connected to the grid, it will become more and more expensive. Yeah. Because the remaining people will be having to pay for it. Yeah, it's the same as postage now, you know. Mm. Posting letters is getting more and more expensive because fewer people are doing it. Yep. So that is an issue that needs to be part of this whole story because we are creating the future with this technology, but we're also creating cities that are going to be more livable. And that was the word constantly said this morning, but I don't think they realise there are issues in how you make that livability. It has to be a well distributed for a start. So um, distributed can be equitable as well as all over the place. Um, yeah, Cheryl, so you want to add to that? Thanks, Cheryl. I'm just going to be devil's advocate sitting here doing my marking and looking at some of the things the students are coming through with. It is relevant. So sitting here thinking, when I think about how a forest does energy and I think about there's there's pretty major pathways there in terms of primary nutrients that go from one place to another and they're the equivalent of our highways of energy supply and demand here. There's lots of secondary and tertiary systems and probably others that have more minor roles to play in the giving and taking of energy in lots of different ways because actually the need is not for the energy, like Amory says, that people don't want people don't want electrons, they want hot showers cold and cold beers. <laughs> well, some critters don't want hot showers or cold beers. They want somewhere comfy to sleep and that happens to be something that requires energy to produce. So what the thing manifests as, I think will provide us with a lot of diversity going forward. I'm just sitting here next to Lavanya thinking for Melbourne, 
what does it look like? It's a very different conversation when we put energy into meaningful things for the people that are in that place. So, yeah, listening to the, the language around livable housing and livable whatever, I think people say that quite flippantly. When you look at place-based comforts, you think, eh, what does it look like for there? For Japan, absolutely, their place-based um, survival mechanism is um, earthquake resilience and heat waves and um, and typhoons. So their solution for that in having these little mobile power stations that can drive around and provide energy makes so much sense for that system. And their power plants that are nuclear based just sit there uh, idling away, costing them a lot of money. You know, I think that diversity of what energy means is a really useful conversation from that groundswell of community awareness raising and thinking back to what I learnt yesterday from the power of yarning about this stuff is that actually yarning about energy is not very sensical for a lot of people, but yarning about what they need to be comfortable is. So I wonder whether there's some translation work that's needed there, a bit like raising awareness about what federal politicians do in an election. There's something there about raising awareness about what energy does for our system in a community accessible way, which might actually get us to that increased awareness around can my car power my house? Well, that that actually might become a very sensible conversation when it's a groundswell driven for that place. Mm. Thanks, Cheryl. Just a quick story about place. Um, White Gum Valley is a project we, our research group was involved in for some time through the CRC and uh, low carbon living. It is a hundred or so units of development in a suburb, middle suburb of Fremantle that had the opportunity to redevelop at a higher density with opportunities for doing innovative technologies and innovative community engagement this is a very high green voting area uh, with an com enormous commitment to their place. And the first reaction, of course, was, what, you want to bring medium density development here? This is White Gum Valley. We all have our little permaculture business in the backyard and we're all very community oriented and the school is the centre of attention. So it was a negative reaction because they thought it would mean all the trees were knocked down for a start, but something about a precinct scale means you can build at a, in a way that keeps the trees, and they did. Josh Byrne was put in charge of all the landscaping. In fact, a lot of the ideas came from Josh. Gardening Australia, Friday nights, um, and uh, he... Um, was able to show them how they could get 100 units onto a site that would normally have been subdivided for about 20 uh, in separate lots and had three different types of medium density development put in and they were able to create a new park out of a sump that was there and had a big fence around it. And so the local community got a, a wonderful new park, but they also got a community that was run entirely off solar and batteries and had electric vehicles plug in to enable them to share that solar and batteries, but not to go the other way. It's not bi-directional. That's not allowed yet. But this was a trial to see how it worked, and it clearly is net zero. There's enough solar there and batteries to store it, the, and it's all shared. So three different sharing operations in the three different kinds of development. One's a private one, one's a social housing cooperative for artists, and the other one are young um, uh, professionals. And that group, the, all of the groups have actually worked very well. It is managed through blockchain. And Charlie, you haven't mentioned blockchain here, but as a mechanism, the blockchain system enables that to work, doesn't it? Um, 
and uh, Gemma Green did her PhD on that and um, then set up Power Ledger. And they are working now in 27 countries with uh, about 90 staff um, and they are exporting that service of how you share solar uh, using blockchain. Very simple way to just keep all the records and enable it to be managed simply. So you just don't worry about energy or batteries or your electric vehicle charging and how it's shared. It's all done together. So that's a very smart system, but it's also net zero, very attractive and an amazing place. You go there, you people love it because of the place. It's an architectural design for hope. That's, um, that's Krishna's book title, Design for Hope. And it's, it is a regenerative project. It shows it. So we've got a few coming and they're now trying to copy it in a few places in Perth, but mostly the utilities didn't like it. They didn't have anything to do <laughs> except name, say no at various times and they just finally got it through as a demonstration. Mm. And it works. So this is the kind of transition we're in and why we need to share this sort of experience. And we are talking to Rob Adams and... Dominic, about this in the city of Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah, my, my question is, with what you're seeing, and this is for James and Charlie, I think, do you see this being a future flexible arrangement that is beginning to appear on the landscape? The things that are betting in and betting down, do you what, what see them mean? being do you, do you flexible? see them being flexible to blockchain to other types of sources of energy that might come into play, other types. I mean, it's hard to know what you, you, we don't know what we don't know. Are there, I, when I was building the building in 79, there were certain things that we did know that we needed to leave gaps, needed to leave extra conduits, you know, physically speaking in the building wall. Explain so more, your building first. <laughs> so when we were doing a building on, uh, on a university campus yeah. and we were thinking about, we didn't have enough solar space on the roof, frankly. We just didn't have enough space. We we're like, oh, surely, surely solar power in the future is going to get a lot better at doing what it does. But we need to have, effectively, lungs big enough to catch that air in the metaphor. So we've got to have more space for conduits for future putting in of whatever we need to help that happen. I'm just wondering whether in the systems that you're seeing uh, evolving, there is that think ahead to say, let's just make sure we don't get too specific in what we're creating you could start by not putting in gas. <laughs> that uh, that enables you to have a future where you don't have to spend all the money taking it out um, because it, when it's not going to be relevant. It's so much cheaper and better to not have gas in for heating or cooking. It is really silly. Now you've got heat pumps and uh, uh, what do you call them? Inductive cookers. Um, so all of that um, can be done, but I think it's very hard to do what you're saying, to actually build that into buildings to say we need to be, I, I suppose you can do it with modular construction and things like that, but the the wiring and the the systems, they're very hard to, uh, to make kind of, big empty parts of the box or something. That's okay. It'll work. I have another question. Krista, did you oh, just okay. turn it off? Peter? No, I just turned it on. Oh, can, I, can I just jump in and answer Try just real quick before Try we go? Before we, before we change topics. Chris, oh, we're not changing. Krishna's going to respond to that. Oh, you respond. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm not responding. I have another question. Oh, okay. Hey, do you, yeah, you want to jump in? Super quick. question. Um, only because um, a WGV was the uh, project from which I grabbed my data. So um, uh, one of the contributions we made from that project was um, influencing state government R codes um, for particularly around capacity sizing for future apartment buildings. So the whole pur purpose of WGV to begin with was creating a scalable governance model such that any apartment building across the country that falls under strata or community title can share battery and solar systems like they would share an elevator or a common lobby. 
So yeah. rather than having a managed investment scheme where you have you know sophisticated um, buyers and retail and commercial arrangements around a profit generating device, you can treat that asset like you would at an elevator. Yeah, you can nice. all share the share the blessing, share the burden. Um, those assets, um, you know, rapidly pay themselves off, even though we did use grant funding. Um, but ultimately, some of the um, uh, learnings from that was yeah around capacity sizing. So. Um, one of the, we provided feedback to the Office of Government Architect in Western Australia. They were the office tasked with uh, assessing the R codes, and they actually increased um, the electricity capacity requirement for all new apartment buildings to accommodate future EV charging. So, although these buildings weren't putting in charging devices, um, they were um, having the kind of the foundation in place to do that. Um, other kind of forward-looking things that kind of came out of that project as well was um, look the genesis of Power Ledger was. Um, putting in smart metering systems within those buildings to, to, to benefit from the exchange of local electricity. Now, you know, I, I might have sounded very negative before around, you know, just focus on the prosumer, focus on behind the meter. Um, this is the example of prosumers taking the network back. So, so the business's usual approach of doing an apartment building in Western Australia or Australia-wide, more to that point, is allowing energy retailers to reach inside the building. Um, and what they'll do is they'll charge for every single metre in that apartment building, um, but they'll be reaching in onto your infrastructure. So what we did at WGV was we said you have to stop at the gate, and what we're going to do is just use an automatic software um, to, to measure, report, and verify all those transactions that occur behind the metre. Um, and so, yeah, what we're seeing is this kind of pushing back from the community scale where we're kind of um, becoming master of our own domain and, and benefiting from the surplus of electricity. Um, in fact, so much electricity is being exchanged within those buildings, it also flows out onto the distribution network into the adjoining building. So physically there is transactions occurring between the buildings, okay. but um, the regulator have stepped in and said, well, no, we, we don't allow that. So, so whilst we will still on charge the building for consuming that electricity, um, none of that money will go to where it's coming from. Um, we'll, we'll, <laughs> We will benefit from that, yeah. And and so what we're seeing is a physical exchange taking place, just like a natural system. Um, but the um, innovation outpaces regulation. So um, regulations assume all energy comes from Collie, um, and so there's a transmission and distribution charge put on that, and the retailer benefits that um, benefits from that. So so yeah. Um, I mean, how do you future proof those systems? Uh, you look, you know, how long's a piece of string? What's around the corner? Um, but um, but ultimately, you know, we can um, show innovation through demonstration. And I guess the, the the benefit really is then just transmitting those ideas, open sourcing them, and providing automated softwares to benefit from that as much as possible. Mm. Fantastic, thank you, James. That's that's really good insights. I think the main thing, Cheryl, that I was, when I was listening to what you're saying was, um, in order to do future flexible anything, really, you just need well informed and strategic planning, which we just don't have. And my fear is that we're going to try and use the old systems to respond to the new situation, and, and it's just not going to work. Yep. Good insight. We're, we're, we're six Best minutes over our time slot. You guys are missing out on afternoon tea, I think. So, so I'm, I'm at home, so I can Krishna sit here. Is, Krishna <laughs> is going to have the last word then. No, I'm, I'm picking up on the future flexibility issue. And just thinking about the impact of climate change on all these systems. So it's not just the increased cooling load that we're going to need, but the cooling needs of these systems themselves and their performance in higher temperatures. And is that being factored in? Mm. Um, Dean's the electrical engineer. Do you think so? Uh, I don't have an experience on this, but, you know, most most uh, HVAC systems are designed to operate, you know, in the climate extremes of their markets. So, you know, if it's designed for Canada, they know how to make them work when it's really cold. And if it's Dubai or Perth, they know how to make it work when it's really hot. Mm -hmm. So I think it's solvable, but it, like it's an important factor. It may be that, you know, Canada doesn't get as cold as it used to and other places get mm -hmm. much colder. So I, I don't think there's a technology problem, but it may be, as you say, something to be flagged. Yeah, great. There was one other thing, just picking up on the Excellent. the um, um, the infrastructure. Um, I do know now that um, developers like Hesperia, who are very thoughtful, forward-looking people, now when when they build car parks, 
they, they, they leave lots of room to put wiring in and put lot, lots of big thick wires in in future. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing that's been happening, um, a lot of the apartment complexes that already exist are actually the body corporates are spending money to to make sure that there are big thick copper wires going into the basement so people can add charges. Hmm. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? And if you your house is ready for the next technology, then that will be worth more, be yeah. more valued. And, and actually, because the, the labour is even more expensive than the copper, just leaving, just making it really easy to put stuff in, as, mm. as Cheryl noted, is is actually probably the, the best thing you can do anyway. Mm. All right. Thanks, team. Peter, do you want to you wrap up for us? Cheryl, Cheryl wants oh, to No, I won't one. have the last say. Peter can have the last say. We're just sitting next to Krishna. Just, you know, in nature, when you have excess, it doesn't mean it's excess in the whole system long term. So it can look like you're creating excess capacity or that you have waste in the system in the now, mm. but in the bigger picture of the system, that is not waste or excess. So as a tree mm. loses its leaves, you think, oh, how wasteful those leaves are falling to the ground. But when you realise they're connected into recharging the soil to grow more trees, you think, oh, how efficient. So that mind flip from is it waste or is it efficient I think we could have a lot more fun in playing with that to see where we really could achieve some interesting gains. Yeah, I I heard you ask what's going to happen with the power production itself in the new technology like the solar and wind systems and whether or not they're going to be have to be um, considered differently because of global warming. Mm. Um, and there is a sense in which some people are worried about solar. PVs work less, uh, are less effective in hot weather. Um, so and it will be hotter, so less power is being made. Well, roughly 1% per degree, in one degree increase. Yeah, so it's not, it's, it's, yeah, and in some colder places, it'll be better. Well, they're now finding in Europe that there's a lot more solar that they can produce than they thought possible before. And um, the other thing is some people are, are making combined biophilic and PV systems for rooftops that keep it cooler. Plants can actually help make a more beautiful and a, a cooler environment for PV to work. That's a really interesting integration of the uh, professions mm. as well as the uh, um, uh, the the technologies um, so you've started to open up a whole lot of stuff Charlie um, in two years time when you come back you'll say geez we didn't have much of a clue then but it's all happening now because um, very quickly the thanks, image thanks I, to I have James, thanks to yeah. Dean and James we might be able to keep up yeah, that's right. We need, well, everybody. We need everybody. We really do. And that's, that's just, uh, crew. yeah, but in the crew uh, as well. And certainly, uh, Charlie, it's um, it's good to see you thinking these through and having an open mind to it all because it's, I, I don't think the, you know, most people will come to these issues and say, well, what can I bring to this? You know, I might be able to help answer this or that but in general the main thing you can bring is an open mind and say yeah. how, what can we do in this together and think it through it's a fantastic time to be alive and professional and research oriented and practice oriented because we're all working it out together so nice to see Thank thanks for helping us charlie no problem at all have a fantastic rest of your session and i hope this afternoon goes really well and uh, enjoy, enjoy. The, I'm sure the hope the weather's over there is nice. You can enjoy a bit of, bit of face to face time. It's been sorely lacking in the last two years. Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, Melbourne weather, very nice. Um, yeah, go and see your mum. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Take care. See you. See you, everyone. Thanks, James. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Krishna. Thanks for your questions. We appreciate it. See you, Dean. See you, guys. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>